everyone. This is the first video in Module 4 on solutions in colloids. Here we're really going to be kind of continuing that discussion of liquids, the discussion of solids, the discussion of intermolecular forces from the first two units, and start talking about things that we really use in lab and in uh, chemistry on a regular basis. This is where it's going to start looking more like traditional chemistry to you, um, and so it may be a little bit more comfortable as we move into this unit. So here we're going to be looking a little bit at the properties of liquids, and really we're going to be focusing in this unit on how those solutions form. So in terms of our outline, this is where we're going to be for this video. We're going to start by talking about what does it mean to be a solution. We're going to get into the different um, things that could be in solution. And then how or why does a solution form? Why doesn't it just stay as two separate entities? Now remember, in the last unit, we really talked about intermolecular forces. And remember, we said that Everybody has London dispersion forces, whether you're polar, whether you're not polar, no matter what, you have this. It is a temporary uh, disturbance of your polarity that causes it, and really it's the equivalent of, you know, gravity. Everybody has it. The only thing that makes London dispersion forces larger is the larger the molecule, the larger that force. Dipole-dipole uh, um, and hydrogen bonding are specifically in polar molecules. Um, dipole dipole is in all polar molecules. Um, hydrogen bonding is only present if you have NH, OH. Um, there's a little bit of uh, discrepancy, but either SH or FH bonds. Um, there I will not try to trip you. Sometimes they talk about all four, sometimes they only talk about three in a text. And so regardless of how they edit the textbook, you know, this semester, those are the ones that will be uh, hydrogen bond able. Now, those are for more covalent molecules. We really didn't talk too much about the dipole and or the dipole ion interactions that can happen with um, ionic compounds, but that's okay because here we're going to kind of do a little bit of a review of what happens when you dissolve a salt in water, what happens when you have those electrolytes present, um, and that kind of thing. Now, electrolytes are just substances that when you dissolve them in water, they're going to conduct electricity, and it's because they have an overall charge. Now, in 111, we deal uh, primarily with salts and things like NaCl will break apart into solution to form Na plus and Cl minus. Now, when we have the positive charges, we have the negative charges, with, when it's in water, you can start to conduct electricity, which is why you're not supposed to go swimming and stuff in water uh, during a lightning storm. Now, Electrolytes can be one of three categories. You can have non-electrolytes. These do not dissociate in water at all. They are usually organic compounds like alcohols or um, sugars, that kind of thing. They can also be insoluble ionic compounds, things like silver chloride. Um, think once you have uh, soluble ionic uh, compounds, they can break apart. And that's when you get something like NaCl breaking into Na plus plus Cl minus. Um, you have, if it's a strong electrolyte, this is a one-way arrow. Every single one of these sodium chloride molecules is now present in water on this side. They are no longer bonded as a molecule. It is now only the ions that are present. On the other hand, though, you can have some electrolytes that partially dissociate. Things like weak acids will do this, um, like acetic acid, HC2H3O2. Um, and I guess like if you really wanted to, you could do CH3COO- as your acetate ion either way. What happens here is you end up getting 
more of a reversible arrow here. Now, what that means for us is when we add in this acetic acid or um, ethanoic acid, what will end up happening is you end up getting about 95% stays over here and about 5% breaks over here. And so 95% is present as the molecular form, 5% is present as the ionic, which means you have some ions present that are going to help you have that electricity being conducted. Um, it's just that it's not going to do it as well. And so in general, um, strong electrolytes are things that are uh, always soluble, completely soluble. Weak electrolytes are things that only partially dissociate. And those are typically pretty you know, straightforward. I'm not going to try and trip you up with that. Um, for me, these are things like weak acids, weak bases, um, most everything else is going to be um, a, either a strong or a non. Now, how do you remember whether something is soluble or not? I know it's been a long time since chemistry 111, and so I want to go back through those solubility rules. Now, I'm a visual person, so I have this table. If you had me in 111, you know that I'm a big fan of that kind of thing. Um, but I also have it here as, um, you know, the written rules. And so you can use whichever one you want. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but that way you don't have to focus primarily on uh, something that isn't helpful to you. So going through this, nitrates are completely soluble. It doesn't matter what you add to them. They're always going to be soluble. It is always going to be um, that way, uh, you know. And so it doesn't matter if we have nitric acid, um, silver nitrate. These are completely soluble. They are strong uh, electrolytes. Anything with nitrate is going to be a strong electrolyte, okay? Now, group one metals, anything with ammonium and anything with acetate is going to be soluble. So it doesn't matter if we have sodium cyanide, um, ammonium hydroxide. These things are completely soluble and they are going to be strong electrolytes. Okay. So if we go up to the rules that are written here, nitrates, group one metals, ammonium and acetate containing compounds are always soluble. There's no exceptions. It's always going to be soluble. Now, the only thing I would say is acetic acid is the only time where it one of these will not be strong. Um, and under those situations, because it is a weak acid, it counts more as, um, as a weak electrolyte. But again, it's, it's soluble, and so I just want to point that out. So now moving into the next one, um, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Um, these are soluble, and then I have this arrow. This arrow means unless bonded with. So chloride, bromide, and iodide are soluble unless they're bonded with silver, mercury, or lead. If they're bonded with silver, mercury, or lead, they go from soluble oops, to the insoluble side. Not soluble, insoluble, whatever. Um, and so silver bromide, um, lead iodide, these are insoluble. And so if you see <laughs> chloride, bromide, or iodide bonded with silver, mercury, or lead, there we go. Um, that is an indication that it's a not soluble uh, compound. It's going to be a non-electrolyte. If chloride, bromide, or iodide is bonded with anything else, it's going to be a strong electrolyte, though. Now, sulfate. Sulfates tend to be soluble unless they're bonded with barium, calcium, mercury, or lead. If you have barium sulfate, calcium sulfate, mercury or lead sulfate, it is insoluble. It is going to be a non-electrolyte there. Okay, so now 
up here. Sulfates are soluble unless paired with barium, calcium, mercury, or lead, in which case they become insoluble. Hydroxides. Hydroxides are not soluble. There is only one exception, and that is, oh, there's a couple exceptions, sorry, unless bonded with barium, calcium, group 1 metals, or ammonium. Once hy uh, hydroxide is bonded with these guys, barium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, group uh, sodium hydroxide, you know, those things, then it becomes soluble. Um, and then uh, sulfates, I'm sorry, it should be sulfides. That's what I'm seeing here. Sulfides, carbonates, chromates, phosphates. Um, these are not going to be soluble unless they're with group 1 metals or ammonium. And so like up here I have group 1 metals and ammonium, but I'm just kind of reinforcing it down here. You have a group 1 metal or the ammonium ion, it is soluble, okay? And I'll fix that typo before you guys see it. So in terms of what does an electrolyte mean, ethanol or other uh, covalent compounds that do not dissociate are not going to break apart. There's not going to be any ions present. And so these don't have any um, way to conduct electricity, so those are non-electrolytes. We can set up where we take, um, I forget what the, the, the device is really called, but the electrodes and attach it to a light bulb. If you do that with an ethanol solution, um, it doesn't conduct electricity. It's no big deal. On the other hand, if you take something like potassium chloride, we know this is soluble. Um, it's going to break apart because it's got potassium. It's got chloride. Um, both of those are soluble things. Um, even if, you know, KOH, because there's a group one metal, it's soluble no matter what. These completely break apart, so you have your ions floating around in solution. You uh, expose it to an electrical charge, and you, you're going to get electricity that conducts very, very well. You know, um, that's how it works. Acetic acid um, or other weak electrolytes are going to have some ions present, so they do conduct electricity. It's just you're not going to get the same brightness, the same amount of transfer here. Okay, so in terms of electrolytes, electrolytes are generally, in terms of how we consider it in 111, ionic. But um, you can have covalent electrolytes, the primary one being when water accepts a proton to become hydronium. This hydronium is got an overall charge. It's the same as a polyatomic ion floating around. And so just kind of remember all of your polyatomic ions also count... I don't know what I am hitting to do that. Um, all of them count as ions, and so they will also conduct electricity, okay? Now, in terms of how these things are going to interact, remember that water is polar. It has the hydrogen-oxygen bond, the electronegative oxygen is going to pull the electrons towards it, leaving a partial positive on your hydrogens. This polarity means that water can dissolve both polar covalent mo molecules and ions. So really, anything that's polar is going to dissolve in water. Anything that's not polar, oil, fat, um, alkanes in general, uh, are not going to dissolve in water. They will only dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Okay, so go ahead and hit pause. Try to work your way through this, and then when you're ready, hit play, and we will work through it together. At this point, I am going to uh, consider that you have paused, and we will do this. So, Let's actually start at the bottom because that's the most uncomfortable for me to write and I want to get it over with. So uh, mercury nitrate. Mercury is generally not soluble. Oh, but it's with nitrate. So nitrate is always soluble. So this is going to be soluble in water um, because that's what that table was for. 
And because it is an ionic compound that is soluble, it is an electrolyte. Now guys, notice I don't have strong or weak, I just have yes or no. Um, I'm not going to try and trip you for strong electrolytes, it's things like group one metals, um, nitrate, but for right now, if you know that this is an electrolyte, good. Weak electrolytes are your weak acids, weak bases, and so on. Calcium sulfate. Well, calcium is not a group one metal, it is in group two. Sulfates, there's no rule about group two. Sulfates are soluble, oh, unless they're paired with calcium. And so if we go back to our table for a second, come on. Sulfates are soluble unless they're paired with barium, calcium, mercury, or lead. So that calcium makes this insoluble. And because it's not soluble, it, it's not going to dissolve, it's not going to break apart and dissociate, so it's a non-electrolyte. Ethanol um, is this, H, H, H. This is a polar molecule, so it should be soluble in water. Um, it is an organic compound though, it doesn't have anything that can really break into an ion, so this is a non-electrolyte. Ethanol. I guess I should write it all the way out. Here we've got a nice organic molecule. Again, we've got a polar, um, molecule except this one can actually undergo uh, hydrogen bonding as well so this is definitely soluble in water but it is an organic it's not going to be an ionic compound so this is a non-electrolyte um, glucose is C6H12O6 I really don't want to draw it all the way out it's a sugar um, if you've ever, I mean, this is actually blood sugar, so it, it's definitely soluble. But remember, sugars, sugars in general are polar, so they are going to dissolve in water. And um, because it's a covalent compound, it's a, an organic molecule, this is a non-electrolyte. I'm going to stop there. Copper 1 phosphate. Now, remember if you wanted to find out what the charge on copper is, ion number, charge in total. Here we've got copper and the phosphate ion. Phosphate has a charge of minus 3. We also know that there's two coppers and one phosphate in this molecule with an overall zero charge. That should actually be a 3. Another typo. I'm on a roll today. Um, so here gives us a total negative of minus 3, means this has to be plus 3. 3 divided by 3 is going to be 1 plus, so it's copper 1 phosphate here. Now if we look at our table, um, phosphates are not soluble. Copper is not going to change its mind, so this is not soluble. And because it's not soluble, it can't break apart, which means it's also a non-electrolyte. Now, silver bromide. Bromine is usually pretty, uh, bromide is a soluble ion, but here it is paired with silver, which means it will not be. So this is not soluble in water, and it is a non-electrolyte because it cannot break apart. Carbonic acid. Here to me this is the, the tricky one. Um, acids in general are kind of soluble. Um, it's with a group one. It's soluble. Uh, this is a weak acid. And so that maybe that helps. Um, I did this on purpose, but then I kind of am doubting myself a little bit. 
um, how much do I want to give you right now as opposed to later in the unit. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. Even though carbonate does not want to be soluble, it is with a group one. And so it is soluble, but because it's a weak acid, it is a it is an electrolyte, but this would be another example of a weak electrolyte. Okay. So that's kind of how I view these. Um, let's move into solutions. So anytime we're talking about solutions, what we're really doing is we're talking about homogeneous mixtures that have really small particles that you cannot see. Okay. Now, generally, there's going to be two types of things present. There's going to be the solvent, which is there in the greater amount. It is the thing that does the dissolving. Now, for us, usually that's going to be water, but that's not always the case. I, I mean, if you look at um, some of the industry applications, you have to use nonpolar solvents like hexanes to dissolve nonpolar solutes. So for us, it's usually water, but really it's just whatever is there in the greater amount. The solute is the thing that is being there um, that is being dissolved. It is the thing that's present in the smaller amount. Um, the idea here is that these two are mixed well enough and the particles are small enough that these will never separate out. It's going to be a solution from now until the end of time. Now, both solvent and solute can be any phase of matter, which is why we spent time talking about solids. We spent time talking about other things um, in earlier units. And just to kind of um, bring it up now, if you look, we have a couple of different things here, like uh, solutions. We can have things like air, which is a solute of gas in a solvent of gas. We're breathing in a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and other things. The solute is what we take. The solvent just stays where comes right back out. Soft drinks, we have gas and a liquid here. This is usually the um, uh, the CO2 gas is what kind of gives it that tang. Um, if you've ever drank, had a sip of a flat soda, it's just not good. Um, but gas and liquid. Hydrogen and palladium. Um, this is one example. You can also kind of think of things like pumice stones. Um, or other like lava type rocks where you have a gas and a solid. You can have alcohol mixtures where you have things like water and isopropyl alcohol or ethanol and, and water depending on which and which application you're looking for. Salt water, the ocean water, you have NaCl which is a solid solute in a liquid um, solvent. And then things like brass, you have two solids that are being mixed, the smaller zinc solute, the larger copper solvent. Point of this is any phase of matter is possible. So why do the solutions form? Now, we come back to this topic a lot later in the, the semester when we talk about entropy. Here, I'm just going to bring it up. Life in general proceeds to a more disordered state. When it rains, it pours. Um, if you've ever tried to stack laundry in the presence of a toddler, you know that the that laundry is not going to stay folded. If you've ever had to clean your room, you know that it didn't stay as clean as it was when you first got it. We in the universe in general will just always spontaneously progress towards more disorder. And so entropy is just disorder. And making more disorder is favorable. So when you increase entropy, it is a favorable process. And if you have two separate things like down here, we, here we have helium and argon. If we were to open this, this doesn't stay over here and this doesn't stay over here. That's not how the world works. As soon as you open that valve, it starts to mix together, okay? And so the reason that that happens is because of entropy. Anything that causes an increase in entropy is going to happen spontaneously, which means it's just going to happen without any outside input, okay? We don't have to force it. So a decrease in internal energy of the system and an increase of disorder of the system is what is really causing this to happen. 
So let's go into what this really means. So in general, when we talk about solutions, solutions are going to begin with separate solute and solvent molecules. Now, if they're only attracted to each other, like maybe if you have oil and water, this is really attracted to the other London dispersion forces. This has got hydrogen dipole and London dispersion. They want to stay separate. They can do more when they're alone. You add oil to water, it breaks apart the dipole and the hydrogen bonding here. However, if the molecules are more attracted to one another than to themselves, they will start to mix. And so you can kind of think about this when you add like a tea bag or a Kool-Aid pack or a seasoning pack to, you know, ramen or something. It doesn't just stay there. It pretty much instantly starts to disperse and you can really see that happening. Um, even if you consider, uh, you know, I usually use the example of something like Doritos in a classroom. If, you know, you're not supposed to eat in classroom and you're like, well, I'm just going to sneak these, you know, delicious Doritos, and you open that bag. Well, as soon as you open that bag, the scent, the concentrated scent of the Dorito flavoring starts to expand from this tiny little bag out to the rest of the room, um, or in our case, the house, because as soon as my husband opens them, three toddlers go running to get some. Um, and so it's a matter of it diffuses because there's more disorder to have these molecules out in the classroom. Now, you can kind of think about this in terms of it randomly goes from very concentrated to more random until you eventually get as random as possible here. That is the overall goal. Now, as we start looking at this, though, I think the easiest way to view this is with, um, please play. Okay, we're going to have to hit stop and show. Discard. And so you can kind of view this as if you added food coloring to water, you can see, oops, it's not going to stay as droplets. It's going to start to disperse within that solution uh, really well until it... Uh, eventually will take over this whole thing. Now you can even see this is a cold solution, this is a hot solution, and so the speed of the molecules is faster, so the mixing happens faster over here. Uh, it's also a density thing a little bit, which is really awesome, but beside the point. The point is if you walked away and came back, it would be relatively uh, well mixed. Let me put this back so we can have this to talk about. Now what that's going to do is once you have that mixture happening, it's going to allow for an interaction between the solvent and solute. So here we've got the ion sodium, the sodium ion, the charge here is interacting with the delta negatives on all of the oxygens from the surrounding water molecules, and so it's stabilizing each other. Solvent is stabilized by the presence of this positive. The positive is uh, stabilized by the presence of the delta negative. Everybody's happy. So in general, when we start talking about this, what's going to happen is we have to consider all of the things that come into play when we are making a solution. And so if you consider, you know, we started off with something like your food coloring or your sugar packet, and then you have your water over here, you have to separate this from one another. You have to break apart those molecular interactions 
things like ionic bonds, things like dipole-dipole interactions, so that you end up getting molecules that are separated. So for us, we call this lattice energy. It is the energy that it takes to break apart the solute. It, it's going to be endothermic. It takes time. It takes energy to break apart those interactions. They wanted to interact, and we're forcing it to not do that. Now, this gets larger with an increase of charge. You can kind of imagine if you have a charge between two positive, two negative, it is really strong compared to one plus and one minus. This is the equivalent of one bond, two bonds, or even more. Uh, it also gets a little bit larger with the smaller you get. The smaller your atomic radii, the closer you are, the nuclei are, and so you end up having um, a stronger attraction there. The bigger one, though, is definitely your charge. That The bigger your charge in number, the stronger that, that attraction, the larger your lattice energy. Now, you also have to break apart the interactions of the solvent molecule, and that is also going to be endothermic. It is um, going to be the time it takes to really separate the hydrogen bonds, the dipole bonds, and things like that. Then as we continue, you start to interact the hydrogen, the water, and the solute. It, they restabilize each other. And the overall energy of the solution is the sum. So here we break apart the solute, we break apart the solvent, and only once you break those interactions can you kind of see if it's stable to have them here, mixed together, working together on their own. And when it is all said and done, uh, the, this is only going to form if this is sufficiently stable that it overcomes, it's exothermic enough to overcome the, the input here in these two steps. Kind of think about this as you invest energy in a retirement plan, you invest energy, or you invest money in a retirement plan, you put money in savings, in the grand scheme of things, you get much more out of it in the long run. And the same kind of concept here. Hmm. We have to put in energy to break apart the solute and solvent. Then once we solubilize it, mix them together, you get some energy off or back. The overall energy of the solution is going to be the energy it took to break apart those interactions and the energy you get back once you mix them together. If this is negative, it will form. Now if you kind of think about nonpolar oil with water, the salad dressings in the grocery store, this is a hydrophobic compound. It does not like water water hating hydrophobic and so there's not enough interactions to it's only London dispersion there's not enough interactions to really force the issue it's not going to help the oil go into solution which is why if you have like an oil and vinegar salad dressing you have to shake it right before use and then you have to shake it again like five seconds later hydrophilic interactions water loving philic is from the uh Greek word for love, so water loving. These are going to have things like polar structures. They're going to have ionic structures. These allow solutions to form between something that is polar or ionic and water. So is a will a solution form between an oil, which is a long chain hydrocarbon, and then why or why not? Be sure to consider your delta H's. And so as you're going through this, guys, um, go ahead and hit pause and try to consider how this is going to work and then come back to uh, listen so that we can do it together. Now, if we are really considering this, what this really means is if we, let's just think about our solute of oil, solvent <coughs> of water, our hydration energy, 
and then overall. Um, so if we think about this, we have a nonpolar oil. This is going to take a little bit of energy. It's going to take some energy uh, to break apart those London dispersion forces. So this is going to be slightly endothermic. Okay, small positive. Water, on the other hand, has London dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding. That's going to take a lot of energy. So this is going to be highly exothermic. I mean endothermic, I'm sorry. It takes a lot of energy in. It's got to be highly endothermic. I'm ahead of myself. Hydration energy, mixing these two things together. Well, I mean, it, it will give a little bit back because you are going to be able to get uh, some London dispersion forces. And so it'll stabilize itself um, some, but not by much. So you'll get a little energy or it'll be slightly exothermic, which is why salad dressings will stay mixed for that five to 10 seconds. Now overall, you put in a ton of energy and then a little bit more, you get a little bit back. This was a bad investment. And so it's not going to happen. It's still going to be a lot of energy that's needed, which means energy is needed. And so this is not going to form. And the, I mean, if you've ever tried to get oil and water, it's a constant battle. You have to like continually stir it and try and keep it mixed. So go ahead and try and predict what's going to happen here. Um, this is the lattice energy for solute, lattice energy for solvent. Um, this is your H of hydration, and this is your H overall. Make sure that I say it the same way you're going to see it in um, MOM. So polar solute, that's going to take a large positive, or it's going to be large, highly endothermic. Polar solvent, same thing, lots of energy here, highly endothermic. I'm just going to do... Um, because I want to make sure that it's nice and legible. This means highly, and I'm going to do positive for endothermic. Same thing, we have to break apart hydrogen bonds, have to break apart dipole-dipole bonds, highly positive here, or at least dipole-dipole. I guess I don't say anything about hydrogen. Um, now, once you mix these two things together, not only do they get London dispersion, not only do they get dipole-dipole, they are going to be interacting with each other in a way that is awesome. And so this is going to give you a ton of energy back. It's going to be really stabilized. It's going to be awesome. So it's highly exothermic, or I guess I should say highly exothermic, very big. And so this is like saying up, up, down. Overall, you're going to get some energy back. So you're going to get some small energy back or exothermic. Because it's going to be favorable for those two things to mix, they can do dipole-dipole bond. So the solution is going to form. Polar solute, nonpolar solvent. Polar solute still takes a lot of energy to break apart those dipole-dipole bonds. Eh takes a little bit of energy to break apart the London dis dispersion forces. You mix them together, you're not going to get much energy back. It's going to stabilize only the, um, London di the London dispersion. And so you get, it's going to be slightly exothermic here. So overall, big positive, small positive, small negative. This is going to be um, still positive. Still going to be overall endothermic, um, so the solution will not form. And really, it's probably going to be really positive, really endothermic. 
needs too much energy to stay in to, to really form. Nonpolar solute polar solvent. Here this is going to take a small amount of energy to break apart the London dispersion forces in your solute. Going to take a lot of energy. It's going to be highly endothermic to break apart those um, those polar interactions. There's not going to be much that wants to have nonpolar and polar interact. So this is only going to be a slightly negative gain in energy. This is still going to be highly positive, not going to want to form. Nonpolar, nonpolar. This is going to take a little bit of energy. It's going to be slightly endothermic, slightly endothermic to break apart those London dispersion forces. On the other hand, it is going to give uh, some energy back because they're going to stabilize themselves with um, with those London dispersion forces. So it's going to be slightly negative, slightly exothermic. Overall, you get a small gain in energy, slightly exothermic, and the solution is going to form. Okay. So what does all that really mean? What it really means is the solution forms not only because of those molecular interactions, but because disorder in general is favorable. Just try to keep a room clean. It, it, it doesn't work. So anything that increases disorder is going to happen. Processes that require lots of energy, uh, where you have to continually put them in, mixing together a nonpolar solute with a polar solvent or vice versa, it's not going to really happen. It's unlikely. Other times, um, you put a lot, an investment in, you break, put in a ton of energy to break apart polar solute, polar solvent. You mix it together, you get a huge bat amount back. It's like an investment paying off. And so that's when it's going to happen. And so the overall takeaway from the last table is like dissolves like. Nonpolar solute goes in a nonpolar solvent. Polar solute goes in a polar solvent. And it has to do with the mixture of those uh, interactions, the entropy, and all of it coming into play. Okay? That is it for this video. As we move into the next couple of videos, it will really start to um, come together while we discussed this.